Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Um, this is our fifth public session in Democracy Now and Next, uh, which is a reflection of the task force that CSIS, Freedom House, uh, and the McCain Institute have organized in uh, creating and thinking about a new US strategy to promote democracy and combat authoritarianism. Uh, this is done in partnership with our colleagues at Georgetown University. And I want to thank Nicole Bibin Sadaka especially uh, for being so collegial and helpful. Today, uh, and now for something slightly different, today we're joined by <laughs> Stuart Levy. Uh, Stuart is the CEO of the DIEM Association. Did I say that right? DM? DM, yeah. DM, an independent yeah. membership association responsible for the DM payment system built on blockchain technology. So I suspect there may be some questions about that. Previously, he was the chief legal officer for HSBC Holdings and served in the US Department of the Treasury as the first undersecretary for terrorism and financial intelligence under Presidents Bush and Obama. And I wanna note how unusual it is to have a high ranking official be asked to stay on and, and stay on not just ceremonially. I mean, you, you served from 04 in the Bush administration through I think 2011? 2011, yeah. In the Obama administration. So that's a full two years plus uh, into the Obama administration. Uh, during his tenure, Mr. Levy led financial strategies to counter threats to US national security and protect the integrity of the financial system. So a lot of our conversation over the last couple of weeks has been focused on democracy and democracy in decline. But the task force is also about combating authoritarianism. So today we're gonna to start from another angle, the authoritarian side, and with a focus on corruption, which to many is not the first thing that they think about when thinking about democracy and authoritarianism. So let's start with what do we mean by corruption and how exactly is corruption as a tool or even a business model connected to combating authoritarianism, Stuart? Um, well, first of all, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time. And Sarah, thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, uh, you asked the right question, which is, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a strategy to counter authoritarianism and we have focused in on corruption as one of the major tools. Corruption actually is pretty simple to define uh, at, at, at one level. It's, it's simply the um, abuse of entrusted power for private advantage or private gain. Um, of course, that's an enormous uh, um, category of things. And it goes from you know, very small to very large. But you know, on the, uh, in the largest scale, we, we have essentially state capture in certain countries where it's completely uh, overtaken by corruption. And it goes all the way down to very small things like, you know, having to pay uh, a fee to somebody to, you know, stamp your passport, uh, you know, and it's all corruption. Uh, it's just a question of, you know, where you focus in uh, on that. And, and the reason that um, we are focusing in on corruption is that essentially whether you look at it from the authoritarian side or the democracy side, uh, corruption is key. So for authoritarian regimes, um, corruption is a way to sort of consolidate their power and, uh, and um, uh, even expand it. And so they use it uh, as, a, as a means of, of, of coercion and, and expansion. And for democracies, um, it's, it can poison a democracy uh, if, if, if democracy becomes corrupt. But the, 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 other thing, the other way to think about this is that while it's not necessarily the case that authoritarian governments will be corrupt and that democracies will not be corrupt, it turns out that that is what happens. Uh, you know, that uh, the research shows that, you know, uh, corruption is much more prevalent in authoritarian regimes and much less prevalent in, uh, in democracies. Um, and uh, also democracies get, um, you know, somehow uh, abused in, in corruption in the sense that, 
one thing that happens in corruption is that people start to steal, steal money in their own societies and they then place it uh, in, uh, in open societies and democracies. Um, you know, in some ways it's, it's, it's ironic that of course corrupt rulers would rather, they, they, they know where to keep their money. They keep their money in places with rule of law. Sure. Um, and, uh, and so that's another aspect of this. And so part of fighting corruption is, is, to, is to control the financial system and to, and to try to prevent that sort of placement from occurring. Sure. In fact, there's other behaviors. Uh, they place their children in schools uh, where they also place their money, right? So you know, there, there's an interesting um, set of institutions that on some level are enabling. Let me just riff for a second for those of you who have not followed closely what's going on in Russia. This is the story of contemporary Russia and the, and the Kremlin. Uh, there's an amazing hour and a half uh, dubbed in English uh, YouTube by Alexei Navalny who is currently in Penal Colony 2, Ikadba. Uh, and it is a examination of, of, it's called Putin's Palace. So if you Google Putin's Palace, you will find it. And it is the story of the Kremlin siphoning off money uh, and building these enormous elaborate palaces. And I'd also recommend Putin's People. This is a big book. Uh, and it is very detailed by the journalist Catherine Belton, who worked for the Financial Times. Uh, and it is the story of first the KGB, then the FSB. And of course, the FSB has just this morning been um, unmasked, if you will, by the US intelligence service as behind the poisoning of Navalny. Uh, this is a story about creating bank accounts overseas and siphoning off money. And it is the fragility of the system and the nervousness of Putin that he would seek to poison and kill Navalny and then put him in this penal colony. So this is all very much a contemporary story uh, and it's it's happening now. Let me ask you, um, Stuart, Freedom House in its many reports has documented that over say the last 15 years, democracy has been in decline uh, in many parts of the world even as organizations such as the Open Government Partnership has, has arisen. And, and I wanna note, we use the word corruption in many places, but we're, when, we did, when we talk about sort of low level, I paid a bribe kind of thing versus kleptocracy, which is this grand mass scale siphoning off of, it really is different things. Um, but at the same time, is it fair to say that oh, as democracy has declined, corruption has increased. What's, what, where, where are you on that? Well, it's clear that corruption is increasing as authoritarianism is rising, democracy. It, it, so it, as I said earlier, they're tied together. Um, uh, that, that corruption is getting worse. It's hard to, it's hard to measure, right? There, there is something, it, it, people may have heard of Transparency International, they measure corruption uh, perception which is not the same thing as corruption, but they measure corruption perception. That has gotten slightly worse over the last several years. Um, and, uh, but um, th there's no doubt that this is, this is a major problem. I, I, I'd have to say though, it's also an opportunity, right? Because it's a, when you think about this overall um, rise of authoritarianism and decline of democracy, you think, okay, what are our tools to get back at it? What's our tools for fighting back? I think corruption is one of those areas where I have a lot of optimism that there are lots of tools that are for us to use to fight back. And if we can reduce corruption, similarly, we can, we can uh, challenge authoritarianism. So it's not all, it's, it's not all grim. <laughs> so, so you may be actually one of the more optimistic in our collection of the task force can you talk a little bit about the recommendations that you're making? Um, these are big sweeping policy ones and then we wanna get into more very specific ways um, of, of fighting back. And I wanna encourage folks to be thinking about questions because we are gonna come to you. Um, so any questions you have, please use the chat function. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the primary um, framework that, that, that I'm thinking about in terms of how we go after corruption is to use one advantage that we have in this space, which is that um, 
every country in the world virtually says that they're against corruption. Even the most corrupt countries say that they're against corruption. Uh, I just looking, actually it's, it's cited in our report, there, there's a, 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 a UN General Assembly meeting in, in uh, June. Uh, April or May, or June. Yeah. One of the co-hosts is Saudi Arabia, you know, against uh, corruption. So everybody says they're against corruption. So how do we use that to our advantage? It, it, it does mean that if the United States and its allies, and the, here I'm talking about democratic allies that, 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 that want to stand against corruption, are, are creative and work together, we can use a lot of multilateral um, uh, mechanisms to push back on corruption and to be much more effective. Um, uh, so, for example, one, one of the, one of the ones that I like because it's one that I I have personal um, experience with is to use what's called the Financial Action Task Force. Didn't you so the Financial it? Action Task Force? Pardon me. Didn't you create it? Uh, no, no, and no. I didn't create it. <laughs> but you used um, it. I. I certainly used it and I probably, maybe I popularized it, but I certainly didn't create it. So the Financial Action Task Force is a standard setting body that sets, sets rules for you know, what, what countries need to do to fight money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, and lots of, there are lots of organizations out there that do this kind of thing, but this one happens to be very effective. And the reason it's effective is because banks and uh, investors around the world pay attention to their uh, recommendations and it makes a difference in investment decisions. So as, as Sarah mentioned, I worked for eight years as the chief legal officer of a large bank. We wouldn't do business in countries that were, uh, that they didn't have a proper money laundering and terrorist financing regime as determined by the FATF, the FAT. So, um, and in countries, because it affects investment decisions, countries take it very seriously. They, 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 uh, they work very, very hard to improve their frameworks because they're scared of getting criticized by the FAT. Um, and which is a rare thing that the countries pay such close attention to the, the recommendations of this sort of body. And not only do they make recommendations and set standards, they also assess whether things are implemented. So one of the recommendations that we're making in our task force report is to turn attention of the, of the FATF to corruption and mm -hmm. have them set out the recommendations and standards that should be set to um, prevent the, um, the, the laundering of the proceeds of corruption in the financial system and to follow up with um, rigorous um, evaluations and assessments as to whether countries are following those those evaluations. We think that um, focusing the, the the FATF on this would be very effective. As it was, what I did uh, work on very closely was after 9/11, they focused on terrorist financing instead of just money laundering, and it was enormously effective. And I think uh, a similar sort of uh, uh, focus on corruption could be. Um, a, 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 a big make a big difference. Are there punitive measures that FATF takes? I mean, is, is it really just normative? They actually put countries on blacklists, mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's it's almost like they almost say it's not sanctions in the in the traditional sense, but they identify countries that uh, th that are either um, subject to what they call countermeasures, or you know they they have sort of different layers of of sort of um, bad, be, bad uh, of badness, if, if you will, <laughs> going from the, the top to the bottom. And countries are very, very tense about getting um, off. It just as a you know, cute anecdote, maybe. When I, I was an undersecretary of the Treasury Department for seven years, um, you know, that's, that's a senior position, but it's just an undersecretary. You don't normally uh, get approached by heads of state. Countries that were, uh, either proposed to be on the FATF blacklist or other, you know, that, that they were worried about it. I would, they, they would, their heads of state would want to talk to me about it. Wow. Uh, that, this is, this is something they take very seriously. It makes a big economic difference, uh, whether they're put on blacklists. Very interesting. Um, anybody try to bribe you? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> not I was I, I was uh, actually uh, approached for uh, um, I it wasn't about a fat thing, but I, I do remember uh, in a very corrupt country, which I won't name, uh, asking for a, a favor and from the head of state and he referred me to a minister and the minister said, well, the head of state's willing to do, to do this, but what what do we get? And I, and I was a little bit, <laughs> naive. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. Uh, but literally they asked, you know, what are we going to get? What are you going to pay us? No, Very anyway, interesting. I, well, so, I mean, the, the thought of story <laughs> is a, it's a fascinating one. And I mean, I spent a lot of time, as some people know, uh, in the policy realm on combating human trafficking, where the US government has a tier ranking, the State Department has a tier ranking of countries. It has only, it's worked for countries that really care about the reputation, but it hasn't worked for countries that don't care. And there's repeat offenders that end up on the tier three um, trafficking list. And you know we're all scratching our heads about how, wh what more could we do? And I, I sometimes wonder if the FATF, there's something about the way in which the FATF works that we could, ad we could um, adapt. Uh, I mean, Liechtenstein is very focused as a country on making sure its financial system is not aiding and abetting human trafficking. I mean, I, so I think that there's there's a way in which these worlds are a bit coming together, um, which is which is interesting. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the connection between corruption and the undermining of democracy, and specifically how the private sector um, in established democracies, such as banks, uh, real estate companies, contribute to corruption. I mean, I think it's important for folks to understand the massive amounts of corruption is going on elsewhere, but as you noted, there are enabling institutions um, and things that we could do differently, which some of which you're recommending in the report, but you, if you wanna have a comment on that. And we've yeah, got um, questions coming in, go ahead. Yeah, I, well, I, the, the the one question I was reading, why uh, I can answer very quickly, and then and then to get to yours, Sarah. Um, one of the because it, it it also ties to you know how do we get improvement? Um, this question about how when you're on the blacklist, how do you get off? Um, it, it, it there are lots of good examples of countries that have been on this blacklist. They then they they get very serious about passing a, an effective money laundering and terrorist financing regime and they have to prove that it's being implemented and they do improve and the, and the reason they do is because sadly perhaps unlike human trafficking and I, I say this in genuine sadness they care very much about whether they're going to get investment and they whether foreign businesses are going to do business there sadly i think that is a motivator for why they are so serious about this and um it has had very positive effects, including in places where it was very difficult uh, culturally for them to to, to improve. Um, so that that that's the that's the answer. In terms of the way um, businesses and the private sector can be used to facilitate corruption, I mean, it, it, it's frankly the 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 financial system. Uh, as I said, it it people want to put their the proceeds of corruption in places where there's rule of law. So those societies will often have uh, lots of corrupt assets parked there. And it's not just, you know, people have this notion of Switzerland in their mind of the yes. private bank accounts. And that's a bit outdated to be to be fair. I mean, that's not that it doesn't exist, but that's not just a Swiss bank account issue. That's frankly, the United States, the UK, any place where there's rule of law. There'll be lots of uh, there'll be lots of proceeds of corruption parked there, and some of the things that are taken advantage of are, for example, hiding behind uh, you know complicated corporate structures, uh -huh. um, hiding the the um, what's called the beneficial ownership of a of a company, which is a big 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 word, but frankly, it just means that people hide who owns, they, they set up a corporation and they disguise who the real owners are. And then you don't know who's, uh, you know, who, who really controls the, the assets. So there, there are, um, there's a lot of effort and money put into creating these complicated structures that, is, that are being used to hide uh, corrupt assets. The difficulty is that there are also 
legitimate reasons for people to create corporations and to and to seek to have some you know privacy in their in their business dealings and the the difficulty is sort of sorting that sorting that out are shell companies well let me put it this way is a beneficial ownership law specifically to deal with the shell company issue um, the beneficial ownership law that was there's one that was just passed in the United States it is largely for that purpose yes mm -hmm. that that um, people say shell companies it just means that people are creating companies and trying to obscure who owns them right. and so there's just a law passed in the United States frankly the United States lagged behind on this it's one right. of the things that the FATF criticized the United States for um, that, uh, that there was no place to go to see who owned these corporations and what it's going to require with lots of exceptions is that uh, if you form a new company in the United States, you've got to um, file with the federal government and the Treasury Department um, at, uh, the identity of the owners of, of that, that company. I mean, this has really gotten into the zeitgeist, right? I mean, that you can see their documentaries on the Panama Papers, but there are also um, Hollywood movies about this, uh, the way in which people park money. Uh, and and go after these things. And you're absolutely right. People may not know, but uh, this wasn't this in the the defense authorization bill that was passed in December, yes. and it had bipartisan support. So it was a big deal. Also, because I think the Biden administration coming in, if it hadn't been passed, they were very interested in seeing this legislation. So it was a win all around in a time when it was, let's just say, not the headline of the day, if you will, um, but it's an extremely important aspect of it. Um, what the sad thing was, Sarah, that, so that got passed in December of 2020. Right. Um, I remember recommending that bill in 2006 or seven. Gosh. So the, the, the beneficial ownership, and there was quite a lot of resistance to it, even um, you know, in the United States. Um, and as I think you, you, you mentioned to me, um, the states were sort of being competitive with each other to get companies uh, to register in their states and offering better confidentiality. And it was a bit of a race to the bottom, if you will, uh, in the United States itself, which was, I think, sort of sad. But it's a handful of states, right? I mean, it's, it's Wyoming, it's Nevada, it's Delaware. Is it more than that? Um, to be honest, I, I, I I, I don't know. Those those definitely come to mind, but uh, there may be others. But you you could there were those kind of, those states were advertising, you know, register <laughs> right, Nevada right. Corporation, et cetera, right. like like that. Right, and and it's also the case though. I mean, I've read about or and, and journalists have contacted me about all Russian oligarchs parking money in art in auction houses, and the the degree to which the art world may also be implicated. Look, it, it, when it comes to hiding, you know, illicit money, whether it's from corruption or from 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 other crime, um, you know, people will put it, it, you know, in property and you know, real estate, art, uh, anything like. That. I, I do want to, <laughs> I, I do want to make a, a, an important, what I think is an important point, which is um, that yes, the financial systems of the United States and other democracies are used to hide illicit um, uh, um, proceeds. But um, first of all, the United States is still by far the greatest force for good in fighting corruption in the world, right? And I don't think we should lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there's a criminal law in the United States, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which um, you know, criminalizes um, f uh, bribery uh, and also the, the falsification of, of corporate records to hide the bribes have been paid. That was massively consequential when passed and started to be enforced. The UK also has a very aggressive anti-bribery act. So these, you know, the, the United States has improvements to make and we, you know, and so forth, but the, the, the Foreign Corrupt Price Act is, is critical. And one of the things I would just like to share from my experience, you know, working at a major financial institution is that um, one of the big um, factors that promotes corruption around the world is that those countries that do not criminalize corruption for, by their companies abroad, and I'm thinking particularly, for example, with, with respect to China, 
uh, where we would see, uh, you know, uh, massive bribes being paid by Chinese state owned enterprises that were seeking major government contracts. They pay off, you know, corrupt actors in those countries. So an example of, I don't know if any of you have been following the news in South Africa over the last few years, a, a terrible example of state capture mm. uh, where uh, there were corrupt actors that essentially took control of the whole government. They were accepting uh, bribes from Chinese companies to get major government contracts and sharing the, sharing the benefits between the corrupt actors and the Chinese companies. Why does that happen? Well, those companies have no fear of being prosecuted at home for paying bribes in South Africa. American companies, European companies, um, uh, do not have that same, uh, you know, luxury. They're 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 subject to um, to uh, uh, crim criminal um, prosecution if they if they pay bribes. Frankly, even it used to be France was viewed as a as a real problem in this area. But even in France, as as we've seen in recent years, that is um, that that is the case. Of course, and Sarkozy was just yesterday. Uh, exactly. Indicted. Um, let's say in the international space for a second. There's a question about uh, Iraq and and government corruption and unresponsiveness, and this gets into the counterterrorism space actually. Um, that the, the level of corruption and unresponsiveness, uh, Jonathan writes, uh, was a driver of support to ISIS. Many Iraqis feel that life, while not perfect under Saddam Hussein, uh, I guess was preferable than the current democratic system. You could make a similar argument, frankly, in Afghanistan, where- I, I was gonna say, Afghanistan yeah. might be another example, yeah. So I, I guess the question, his question is, how does America do a better job in leading anti-corruption? I would say these are two different questions, but leading an anti-corruption anti and democratization efforts for transitional governments. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, it's a, it's a great question and I think it's, it's a, a dissertation. I mean, yeah. Um, and, and we do try to treat this a bit in our task force report, which is, um, and, and I'm going to say we have recommendations, but I don't want to come across as, you know, somehow think we think we have the Solved answers it. to all problems right. Right. because this is a tough one and, you know, there is no easy, no easy answer. But one of the things that we, we want to make sure that we do as a government is look at um, two, two major efforts that we're making as a government. One is that we're participating in all these multilateral organizations that do uh, provide um, aid and concessional loans around the world. So think, you know, the World Bank, the IMF, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, you know, are we coordinating our anti-corruption efforts there to make sure that the United States as generally either the, the largest donor or the, uh, you know, the, the, the one with the largest stake, are we making, using our significant authority in those organizations to say corruption and, and fighting corruption is, 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 our, is our number one priority? Um, so that's one thing. And, and, and then secondly, to, 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 to make sure that we're, to the extent we're um, distributing um, aid and assistance ourselves unilaterally, right. um, are we doing everything, that, everything we can do to make sure that that is being used appropriately to, uh, to, to fight corruption? Right. Um, We've seen some models that work better. And one of the things that we're doing is like, you know, let's take a look at what's what's been tried in the past. What works best? Um, and actually, what I'm about to say would not apply to Iraq because I don't think they would qualify for this. But uh, nonetheless, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it. So th there's something called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is a pretty small government agency, um, but it has been, I think, it's largely viewed as very successful. In, uh, in in setting out, um, uh, you know, goal, you know, you make it sort of a compact with a country and say, look, if you do the following ten things, there's uh, we'll distribute the following benefits, and it's sort of a um, uh, you know a, a very significant set of controls and con uh, and um, monitored very closely, and it's been very successful at getting countries to make you know, real change. Um, and also, you know, frankly, good for the US from a foreign policy perspective as well. 
I mean, I, I think the cases of Iraq and Afghanistan really underscore the issue of um, certain ways of talking about national security that frankly downplay the issues of corruption and in some ways downplay the issues of democratization. And so part of the story of Iraq in the last, well, since 2003 and Afghanistan since 2001, uh, and you could even make the argument before then, is a need to um, in some ways downplay the corruption aspect and uh, elevate the progress, right? I mean, handfuls of or tons of meetings where people who are working in the either either portfolio working in various countries saying, no, 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 X number of roads are going to be paved. We're going to do all this infrastructure work. And then 10 years later, it hasn't happened. So I think one of the recommendations you guys, in you guys, your working group is making yeah. is um, really elevating, and I think it has great resonance with this administration, is elevating the issue of anti-corruption to a, a much more central position across the interagency. And on some level, this is it, it is part of elevating the issue of democracy and combating authoritarianism. I mean, I mean I, I'm one level, when I was at AID, the corruption work was inside my portfolio of democracy, human rights, and governance, which makes sense. Um, but within the agency, the issues of democracy, human rights, and governance were oftentimes viewed as very niche. And within yeah. that center that was under me, the corruption piece, which was, you know, in a lot of ways, a platform. I mean, either you got it right or you didn't get it right, and none of the rest would fall would flow. So we, we got to like invert everything. And which is, I, I just have to take a second and say, you know, in the sustainable development goals, getting the work on anti-corruption, transparency, and accountability in the SDGs was so important, and that's one of the reasons why we're enthusiastic about SDG 16. Um, <laughs> so. Um, we've got a couple other questions. I have some more questions for you, but let's look at some of the, the questions here. Um, a question about banks. So countries may take the thought of blacklist seriously. How does it affect banks? Um, so, and what recourse does FATF have to discipline banks? So FATF itself does not have the authority to discipline banks. It only you know um, can, um, assesses countries. But what happens is um, regulators, like when I was at uh, HSBC, our, our major regulator was the UK. Um, if, if, if we were doing business in a country that was on the FATF blacklist, you know, the regulator would, would say, well, that's, that's an inappropriate thing. You could be, we could be subject to enforcement action. So the governments of each country have the responsibility for overseeing their financial institutions and other businesses. Uh, FATF is just the standard setting and assessment body. But the people who, who participate in the FATF are people from the finance ministries and central banks of those same countries. So they have, they have the, the uh, enforcement authority and responsibility. So here's a question that is uh, about capitalism. Um, I would say the flip side of that is also about communism. Um, and I think you have strong views on this, Stuart. Is there a perception problem in having, I'm quoting, such aggressively capitalistic societies taking a leadership stance on tackling financial corruption? Um, is there ever any sense there's an inherent conflict of interest or values when America likely comes across as such a materialistic place where we clearly have these growing wealth disparities. Yeah, well, it's very, like, uh, I guess this is Emily's question. It's, it's, it's a really good point and it's part of what we're talking about in the task force. I think there is a, a, a bit of a challenge that we face because of the massive inequality that we have in the United States. On the other hand, Right, I think there is something to be said for, um, you know, it's different for people to. And I, I appreciate that I'm about to say, has you know, people could 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 take a shot at, but essentially, in the United States, for the most part, you know, the, the people who get people who get rich, you know, they they've earned it, right, as opposed to have stolen it. 
uh, and uh, that that is a difference. Uh, so that people there, there's some rule of law that that applies, and that if you are uh, found to have engaged in criminal wrongdoing, you will be punished. And there, you know, that that sort of has a different feel to the rest of the world than uh, than uh, a country where the rich just happen to be the people who have the power to take the assets uh, or control the natural resources. Um, uh, but interestingly, no, go ahead. I think the difference is really having spent time in the Soviet Union, um, when the state, when, when part of the state is captured and corruption isn't a integral part of the state, you, it's very difficult to imagine that kind of a state having a multilateral approach to combating corruption. What we're talking about is deep um, structural problems in the United States that have to do not, they, they may manifest in the state, but there's a whole political side to this and decisions that were made, but also need the need, and I think this is becoming a much more mainstream argument to look at the market uh, and understand and, and correct sort of a market correction. So I, th I think there's, um, it, it is, it's very difficult to explain, but there's a fundamental difference between a, an entire system that is uh, built on um, governing in a certain way that has corruption at its core. Um, we clearly have a lot of imperfections here, but that 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 doesn't describe actually where we're at. There's another, um, yeah, and look, and, and the United States is materialistic and people pursue great wealth, but again, within a framework of, you know, rule of law. Th there's an interesting flip side to this, which is that even in very corrupt countries and in very authoritarian countries, um, the leadership will often use anti-corruption right. as a tool to consolidate power. So um, I think Saudi Arabia is a great example where Mohammed bin Salman, the current crown prince, is actually, at least I'm told, very popular among the, the young in Saudi Arabia. Why? Because when he, he arrested a whole bunch of rich people who, and accused them all of corruption and put them all in, uh, you know, incarcerated them, some in the writs and so forth, and he had this massive corruption uh, crackdown. And it was very popular because the, the young knew, know that their society is corrupt. And so it, even, it, even um, in authoritarian regimes, the, 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 the tools of anti-corruption are, are used to consolidate power, which is frankly a big challenge. Well, this has been true in China. Uh, to a certain extent, it's China. been true in Russia. I mean, Putin has had his own anti-corruption campaigns. Of course, it is the fuel that uh, gets people fired up for the Navalny. I mean, the, the corruption piece is enormous. It brings people onto the street, um, which is extremely interesting. Um, here's another question. Is there any positive, what are the positive incentives for private sector entities in established democracies to not participate in corruption uh, coming from abroad? So look, I. As someone who spent seven years in the U.S. government enforcing against, uh, you know, uh, companies and financial institutions that misbehave, it's easy to say that there's deterrence from being caught. Mm. So that is a piece of it. But um, uh, so you could say, you know, that the incentive is um, is that they can be um, punished, fined, in, in the case of the FCPA, you know, imprisoned, etc. Okay. But actually, I think that one of the things that we found very effective is just the, you know, there is a reputational issue here uh, where um, in established democracies, people who, who um, you know, tend to be you know, at the top of some of these companies, they very much do not want to be seen as facilitating corruption. Uh, and I was. I. Th I think I had much, much more success um, going to talk to CEOs of 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 companies and financial institutions and talk to them about the reputational risk of some of the things that they were doing, uh, 
that, that, that was much, much more effective than, um, than uh, uh, you know, enforcement actions, which are slow, take a mm. lot of time and are expensive. So I think there is a, a reputational, and, and actually um, we, we, we see examples of, of this stuff being exposed in the press and it having real impact on, you know, where, where corporate leaders lose their jobs, et cetera, if they're, if they're found to be in, involved in things. I, I, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was gonna tell a story that had nothing, it, it's not so much corruption, but it has to do with other similar illicit activity about facilitating uh, um, questionable transactions for Iran. I remember when I was the treasury department and uh, uh, Hank Paulson became the secretary of the treasury. And I, uh, one of the, my first meetings with him is I briefed him on what we saw as Iran's procurement network around the world and how they were procuring the items for their nuclear missile program. And there were all sorts of main, main you know, first line banks around the world facilitating these transactions. And he, I finished the briefing and he said to me, are you gonna sanction all these banks? It's gonna, do, it's gonna be, it'll be unbelievable. And I said, no, 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 I'm gonna go talk to them all. Mm. And, um, and just going to talk to them all and saying, you know, they didn't know what they were, they, they at least they didn't have a full They, they, they could pretend they, they didn't doing. know at least. <laughs> yeah, and, and they hadn't really focused on it and they certainly hadn't had been confronted by it, uh, about it by the US government, but an enormous amount of, the pressure that we were able to put on Iran when it was you know, prior to the JCPOA came from just going to talk to people and say, listen, this is what's going on. Do you realize this? And, they, and a lot of them just stopped. So, so let me just be clear. So you're saying that you walk in, you tell the secretary, there's X, Y, and Z mainstream bank that this government is using to, to do what? To wash procure, its money? Pro, well, procure, to procure. procure procure items for their nuclear missile program. So the banks are essentially a part, they unwittingly or wittingly a part of the missile program. Yes. And I think when you say unwittingly or wittingly, of course, that's important, but there's a whole range of, you know, maybe they don't quite understand, maybe they do understand, maybe they don't, you know, but, but if you go in and say to them, look, Mr. CEO or Mrs. CEO, mm -hmm. but this is what's going on here. Uh, are you aware of that? You know, most likely they haven't been made aware of it that starkly, and you know, it led to a lot of them just saying, "We're we're stopping," you mm -hmm. know, and they stop. You know, anyway. So it's true for the corruption too. If you go to go to people and say, and and I know it was true uh, when I was at, you know, I don't obviously I'm not going to give examples, but in HSBC we wouldn't necessarily know. Uh, that something was the proceeds of corruption, but if someone shared that information with us, then we say, well, we're, we're out of that, you know, we're, we're then uh, we'll cut off the business. Sure. So where are you on, this is a question that comes up in a lot of Russia conversations. Well, you know, shouldn't the Biden administration just expose the, you know, Putin's wealth um, or some coalition of democracies? Where are you on this exposure question um, and recognizing that it's, on, for some, it's extremely difficult. Um, but also, should we worry about retaliation? Yeah. Um, well, certainly I think we have to be careful about, you know, if journalists expose these things, we need to worry about their safety right. uh, and uh, retaliation against journalists. Um, I guess I, I'm a believer in the First Amendment. Like I, you know, I think okay, so let let, let, let the journalists, if, if they can get this information, expose it. I think there's something that this is just. I, I'm not going to try to speak for the task force. This is a personal opinion I'm about to express. Mm -hmm. I think there's something different about the United States. You know, just trying to find this information and then uh, and then exposing it. It feels um, ra rather than to use some sort of legal process to take action against it. I think just trying to find information that you think is embarrassing and exposing it feels um, like the KGB. <laughs> like yeah, it feels. It doesn't feel like it's consistent with our values. I, uh -huh. I, I think if if there's something illicit about this money, then you know let, let's, let's a process, start a legal play process. It out. Yeah, that's my view. Mm -hmm. Although even then, so for example, when uh, Yanukovych fled Ukraine, this is the president of Ukraine that 
uh, was refusing to uh, negotiate with the EU and then fled to Russia. Um, and, the, and Yanukovych as a family network had been funneling off billions of dollars, right? F essentially oil money. Um, it was a whole team, I think, at the, at the World Bank that was set up to try and find that money and essentially repatriate it to Ukraine. But it's extremely difficult. And, and Ukraine is a great example because the corruption and the, the, the Russian government's desire to have a, a corrupt Ukraine flies exactly in the face of those in Ukraine who want in a peaceful, prosperous, independent, democratic Ukraine. But, you know, yeah. I mean, part of the portfolio of supporting democratization has to be on some level, not only the fighting the anti-corruption, but if you do have rulers that are siphoning off this money, how do you get it back into the coffers of the government? Yeah, so this, um, you know, tracing and repatriating of, of illicit assets is a big enterprise. Actually, the World Bank plays a big role, as you mentioned, Sarah. Um, and, uh, it's very slow and tedious. It takes a long time, but again, I think, it, but there is a process that you know has to be followed. Uh, I think, as opposed to just exposing it. Um, one interesting thing on this uh, in this area is that countries that used to be the war, among the worst actors here, where they you, you would run into a dead end, like Switzerland, are now much much more cooperative with repatriation efforts. Why? Yeah, it's a why? similar thing to the, what I said about the FATF. They're, they they are worried about being viewed as a uh, a haven country and therefore cutting off business opportunities. So they don't want to be criticized for being a haven, and so they become more cooperative uh, on repatriation. Switzerland's a good example. Uh, Switzerland is now more cooperative in terms of repatri repatriating um, uh, assets stolen by corrupt leaders than a lot of other countries. Is this also a legacy though of World War II? I mean, of Nazi stashing or, or taking the, the, the funds of victims and, and stashing it in Switzerland? Um, I, I'd like to think, I mean, the, their, their cooperation on repatriation, I think you know, <laughs> is late, came later in time than the exposure of what had happened in World War II. Um, hmm. So I, I think it's a separate cause. <laughs> so we have a couple of technical questions. I have a technical question first. One is, um, what are unexplained wealth orders? This is something you probably had, you ran into in the UK. Yeah. And, and yeah. should we have them? I mean, first of all, what are they? Does the UK actually use them? If not, why not? And should we be creating them here? So, when I first heard about these, I thought this is a fantastic idea. So in the UK, there's something called an unexplained wealth order, which, you know, uh, if folks have been to London, you, you may be familiar with this where, you know, the, the, the housing in London is enormously expensive. So there'll be some, somebody who'll buy a, a flat for 15 million pounds or something like this. And, it, uh, and people were saying, well, how did this person who's like a Russian oligarch or whatever get this money and to buy this 15 million pounds? Uh, uh, property. So in the UK, the National Crime Agency can, can go and say, we, we need you to prove where your money, where the money to purchase this, these properties came from. And if you're unable to satisfy them that you that you came by the money lawfully, then they can forfeit your property. Um, and they have this is a relatively new authority. Um, and, you know, when you think about applying it to, actually one of the cases I was just looking at this, you know, there was someone who was um, uh, a member of the ruling family in Kazakhstan that had, you know, 80 million pounds worth of properties. Um, and you can just see why, you know, the probably the salary of the- <laughs> of, $70,000 a year. Is, yeah, $70,000 a year, and they right. bought 80 million pounds worth of property. So you can see the, the temptation. They've actually used it very sparingly, mm -hmm. uh, and actually the courts have been pretty tough on them to make sure that they're not uh, um, abusing it. And um, they've actually lost one of the cases in which they were trying to were trying to take the uh, the property. Um, and so it's very tempting to think, well, this is a great tool. Um, actually, in our task force is 
it isn't recommending that the U.S. adopt them, and, and, and this is partially my reticence about this. Um, I think there's a there's a significant civil liberties issue here. Huh. Um, in, in, if, if to use this in the United States, first of all, we already have very aggressive civil forfeiture laws, which some people may have read about. So already the situation is that the, the government authorities have uh, power to take property or at least uh, uh, disable your use of it um, if they think it comes from illicit activity. But simply um, saying, you know, we want to know where you got your money is um, is is intrusive, and I think you know there there is a significant civil liberties concerns. So um, it sounds like a great idea, I have to admit, uh, and you know, uh, very tempting. But I think um, we we need to balance the the civil liberties concerns as well. Would it be problematic to say you've got Russian oligarch who buys um, Florida mansion for X amount of money? I mean, why wouldn't we want to know where that money came from? Well, it, so the, I guess the idea would be so um, if you think it came from illicit activity, then then you can sue and and try to forfeit the proceeds. But if you just, I, I think in America we'd say, well. Just being curious where the money came from isn't it's good not enough. enough. Like right. you know, yeah. So um, here, there's a really good question. Uh, I was going to take one of the questions. To Venezuela, the or are you going to go to the technical? Yeah. Venezuela. I was going to go to Venezuela, right? Yeah. So absolutely. So let's uh, let's so be this, clear what the question, the question is. Question, yeah, um, the question is. No, go ahead. Are there conditions under which you would not repatriate the money? Um, you know, I mean, I was making the case a minute ago that this money ought to be repatriated to Ukraine, that, that Ukraine has uh, enough rule of law in place to be able to handle it. And lots of people who are very interested in establishing transparency and accountability, but in current Venezuela, would it make sense? And people have to understand Venezuela was the richest country uh, in that region, um, huge oil wealth. Uh, and it is now a terrible state failure. I mean, the health system, gosh, when I served at USUN, we were heartbroken. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's a terrible story. Uh, it, if you have trouble understanding the importance of governance, look at Venezuela. So the question is, wouldn't we better off if we are able to track this money, uh, using it to support refugees, Venezuelan refugees, for example, in Colombia? Yes. Um, so I agree with this sentiment entirely. And the example I'm most familiar with is Libya. Mm. where when I was in the government, which is now a long time ago, uh, we froze, you know, 30 billion, on my very last day in the Obama administration, we froze $30 billion worth of Libyan uh, money around the world. Wow. Uh, most of it in the United States. And I think it's still frozen, right? Huh. Because the question is, who are you going to return it to? So it was frozen to make sure that at the time, Gaddafi and his family didn't didn't abscond with it, um, but even to this day, I believe, and I haven't checked this. I I, I think that it's hard to determine who who should get it. Mm. You know, who should control the money back in Libya. And so, what what makes sense is, as I think the que this question suggests, is that you don't send it back to a government that's going to squander it, or whether it's just going to be tied up in in disputes as to you know who's the legitimate government. Um, and frankly, if you could find a way to use it for the, you know, my view of it was, this is for the benefit of the people mm. uh, of Libya. Um, and I, I think there's a, the, the sentiment in this question is right. You know, this, the, the Venez, Venezuela's money should be for the benefit of the people of Venezuela. If, there may be legal constraints around using it for particular groups of Venezuelans versus others, but you certainly wouldn't return it to the, you certainly wouldn't repatriate it. I do wonder whether we have the multilateral system in place to be able to handle it. I mean, the only thing I can think of is a country would have to go into basically receivership, like a, a Kosovo, if you will. Uh, and so and there are all sorts of problems with that. I mean, and at this point, Libya is, is you know, home to large swaths of parastatal Russian uh, militia uh, and so it's, 
yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in Libya, I think the UN got involved, which is, you know, one of the ways to, I mean, which is not, you know, necessarily the best answer. Governments, right. But, but right. It's, it's at least something. Yeah. Um, so here's a question, and this may go actually to your day job, uh, maybe. Could you so shine some light on what are technological approaches to measuring or sensing corruption? Um, I guess a flip side a of this is, is Bitcoin question, an answer to this? Um, well, yeah, that's- And if too, not, why not? That would be nice to say, yeah. So um, first of all, measuring corruption is very hard. And mm -hmm. so that's why the most prevalent measure is perception, you know, because people, it's, I, I don't want to be flip about it, but people know it when they see it, like, like a lot of things. Uh, and so asking people, um, you know, is your society corrupt? You know, or, and there are also measurements about, you know, the ease of doing business and the, you know, the, the integrity of doing business. And so a lot of it is, is done qualitatively. Um, you're, it, turning it to, you know, virtual currencies, uh, there is something about the possibilities that come from virtual currencies um, that does go to my day job. So, uh, uh, you know, at Diem, which people may have heard of previously as Libra, we've changed our name to Diem, which is that you know, we're trying to set up a, a private uh, uh, um, blockchain based digital currency where, um, you know, we would have uh, greater transparency on, you know, how money was being used. And, you know, for example, there are ways that you could use this to fight corruption, like, you, you know, in terms of sending in aid, you could program the money so it could only be used for certain things, for example. Yeah. And that's something that you can't do with fiat currency. On the other hand, digital currencies can be abused terribly. Um, so China is setting up a, you know, its own central bank digital currency. What, what, what is the main feature of, of China's digital currency? That they will have complete, you can call it transparency, or you can say they will know every transaction of every person who transact in wow. their digital currency, so that the central government will know, you know, who, um, uh, you know, who's giving money to whom and for what. And of course, then they, you, you combine that with social credit scores and so forth, and it becomes an amazing tool of oppression. So, um, you know, it's just like so many other things. Technology right. can be used for good or can be used for evil. Right. Right. That's an amazing. I mean, this is this is headline today. This is happening right now. Yeah, exactly. um, so, you know, this is the, I think one of the great things about this task force is that we did include this issue about finance, development, corruption as, as part of it. So many discussions about strategies around promoting democracy or combating authoritarianism don't have that expertise in the room. So we are extremely uh, grateful. Um, we have we have come to time. Um, I want to thank Stuart so much for taking the time to be with us. Sure. For those of you registered in the class, we have a small group discussion Thursday, same place, same time. Uh, and then, yeah, well, um, and then Tuesday, March 9th, we're going to be joined by Mike Green, a Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, who's been running the working group that's looking at how democracy interacts with trade and development options and challenges. So thank you so much, Stuart. This has been um, hugely interesting, enlightening, and um, topics that just don't get enough airtime. So we well, really thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it and I appreciate the questions. Don't miss Mike Green. He's great. Yeah, oh, he's great. He's great. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. Thank very you, much. Stuart. Be well, okay. everybody. Stay safe. Bye bye. Okay.